everyone. I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com, and today I'm talking with Georgie, aka Haydit, of RayPeteForum.com. Georgie is an independent health researcher and the owner of IdealabsDC.com, a small company producing high quality boutique supplements with the focus of supporting a healthy metabolism. Today, Georgie and I will discuss autoimmune conditions from a bioenergetic point of view or the interaction between an organism and its environment and how those changes influence cellular respiration. In addition to thanking Georgie for talking with me today, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this show and all the content I produce possible. If you'd like to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash Roddy. Without further ado, here is the show. A way maybe to start the show would be to explain how I came across the concept. Uh, I, are you familiar with Datis Karazian and his book, um, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When My Lab Tests Are Normal? Um, no, I'm not. I'm not. But I, I you know I had a brush with MS uh, according to official medicine. So, you know, I, I have personal, you know, vested interest in the I, whole autoimmunity. I, I want to hear about that. This this was a book I came across in about 2009. And this is when I maybe first started to hone in a little bit more on thyroid problems. And then Chris Kresser started like a uh, a series about Datis Karazian's work on autoimmunity and tied it into gluten and vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And now it's uh, an autoimmune protocol. And the idea just that your own body is attacking you and, and basically wants to kill you. And uh, that does it remind you of, uh, remind you of another, <laughs> of another disease like that? You know? Yeah, it does. <laughs> like the, the cancer thing you, yeah. we have talked about repeatedly. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant on the mainstream's view I, because I was introduced to the alternative view almost instantly and I was, uh, because I didn't have really any foundation of what would cause an autoimmune problem, I was just interested in Chris Cresser's and the Perfect Health Diet, Paul Jaminet's and Datis Karazian's view. And then uh, later, and we'll get into it, but Ray Pete's completely alternative view of the immune system based on Jamie Cunliffe's uh, work. But uh, why don't you give me just kind of an overview of your your thoughts on the mainstream's view of autoimmunity, as well as uh, your own experience and anything else that you wanted to add in, Georgie? Mm -hmm. So basically, the mainstream view is that there are a number of autoimmune conditions where the body's immune system goes into overdrive and it starts attacking and destroying selective tissues depending on you know what's what specific condition you've been diagnosed with like in the in the case of um, of multiple sclerosis uh, basically they're, they're claiming that the attack caused uh, the attack mounted by the immune system causes demyelination um, of the nerves and basically this this uh, this interferes with the signals that your central nervous system is sending to your um, to your limbs so eventually people with MS are you know are being told that they'll develop uh, if not paralysis, they'll develop uh, severe uh, movement disorders, um, you know, lack of bowel control. Um, some people will develop, you know, um, um, mental disorders as well. In the case of rheumatoid arthritis, I think almost everybody has heard of it. Uh, it used to be it used to be thought of as a disease of old people, uh, but now you, it's not uncommon to see somebody in their 20s or 30s have a rheumatoid arthritis. So basically mm-hmm. in that condition, the immune system attacks the joints and the ligaments. So these people have pain and swelling, you know, in their knees and elbows and shoulders. And whenever they have an attack, basically they're saying the immune system is destroying that connective tissue that's in their joints. In the case of lupus, um, basically it's, uh, I guess, the most common symptoms that are visible are on the skin. There's a very characteristic uh, sign of lupus, they call it the butterfly. And I think it's basically around, it's on the face, around the nose, and it does look like a butterfly whenever these people are having a sort of like a, an acute exacerbation, which is really what they call the attack. Of the immune system and then um, so what else psoriasis I guess is a very common one you see a lot of ads basically for all these you see a lot of a lot of ads on TV and they're all the underlying explanation is the same there is no known cause of autoimmune conditions uh, some people spec some of the official speculation is that it's caused initially by some by, by a viral agent and we'll talk about this later specifically uh, in the cases of multiple sclerosis they're claiming that it's probably uh, caused by uh, uh, something called the JC virus, which 
more than 90% of the people carry within them. But then the official medicine says, even though it may, the initial immune attack may be caused by a viral agent or some other pathogen, that, that's really not the important thing because eventually the, the immune system somehow goes in overdrive and it doesn't turn itself off after the after the pathogen is has been handled. Did, so that contributes to the uh, to, to the symptoms. Did you want to cover a little bit like the basic view of the immune system, like a self versus non-self? Yeah, basically the, the immune system produces antibodies and and basically depending on depending on the pathogen, um, the, the antibodies can be targeted against a virus. Or, or if the antibodies are the so-called autoantibodies, people with uh, hepatitis, uh, which is also another thing that is, that is called to be uh, thought to be a an autoimmune condition, they produce antibodies that seem to be targeted at the tissue at the tissue of the liver. So each specific tissue can have an antibody produced for it, and that's that's one of the diagnostic methods for a specific autoimmune condition. But that that seems to only work in sort of advanced cases where there is actually tissue breakdown. And and even then, it's it's really not. Even modern medicine doesn't doesn't claim that these auto antibodies are causative. Somehow, they're just saying you know it's a biomarker of the fact that your immune system is attacking you because these antibodies are specific to to that particular tissue which has been affected by the by the disease. And I guess the parallel is from whenever you get attacked by a virus, you produce um, antibodies against that virus. So the assumption is if you're producing antibodies against a tissue that is your own, it's almost as if your body is trying to reject it. And people that have uh, organ transplants, they, they sometimes produce autoantibodies against that, uh, that foreign organ that has been transplanted. That may, have, that may be another reason why people are, are starting to think about you know, the, your immune system trying to sort of reject your own organs due to them somehow being, being pathological. I'm sorry, not the organs, but the immune system somehow getting demented and starting to attack your own organs. And these antibodies have really specific names, like the anti-thyroid antibodies. Like I'll, I'll get an email every so often from somebody with so-called Hashimoto's disease, and they'll be very concerned with the antibodies. And it, it, it seems like a a pretty confusing problem. Do you have any thoughts specifically on Hashimoto's disease? It's possible to cause it actually very easily. If you go and get, I would say, more than three dental x-rays in a month, mm -hmm. you have a dramatically higher chance of developing the so-called Hashimoto's. So in this case, here's a clear example that there's no pathogen associated with, right? So again, go back, going back to the, to the statement that the real cause of autoimmune disease is unknown, but in some cases it's caused by a virus. Well, in this case, there is no virus known that is attacking the thyroid uh, in any shape or form, um, or at least not one that will cause the type of damage that would trigger an autoimmune response. So, but if you, if you expose the thyroid to some kind of an assault, like a ionizing radiation, um, and in some cases actually uh, it has been shown that uh, direct injections of, of, like a, of some, some sort of a liquid that is uh, being used to, uh, to enhance the imaging, I think they, 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 they call it a gadolinium agent, it's also radioactive. So some people who get an MRI of their neck or, you know, some, some other tissue in the area, actually even, even, even in their head, they may get Hashimoto's as a result of them being injected with this agent. Of course, nobody will admit it, but the fact that it happens and it's so strongly associated with the ionizing radiation from the X-ray or from the gadolinium agent sort of suggests that if there is such a thing as an autoimmune condition of the thyroid, it's not caused by a pathogen. I think there's enough evidence to discard the official hypothesis that the... Uh, that the immune system is attacking the, the, the thyroid. I mean, the only thing that can be said in this case is that as a result of radiation, there's an overactive immune response targeted at the thyroid, but not that the immune system is somehow trying to reject it. Here's the funny thing about, about autoimmune conditions, several things we, that are being openly admitted by, open, uh, by mainstream medicine. One of them, and probably the most important thing, is that there is an abnormally high ratio of women to men suffering from these autoimmune conditions. So if you look, on, if you look at the ads on TV, whether it's psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, especially lupus and psoriasis are, you know, the, I think the ratio is especially high, much higher there. Uh, multiple sclerosis, um, all of these things, all of these uh, autoimmune conditions, if you take the average, the ratio of men to women suffering is about four to one. Now, why hasn't anybody looked, you know, at what is the difference between men and women, you know, and, and start with the obvious thing, hormonal, right? So mm -hmm. why hasn't nobody paid attention to the hormonal difference and what role hormones play in autoimmune conditions? Believe it or not, there is tons of evidence that hormones play a role, but completely aside from, from, from what Ray has written. And basically, it's, it's widely acknowledged that 
there is a hormone disbalance that exists in in all of the autoimmune conditions. So, for example, um, there also uh, there's also a great parallel between the autoimmune conditions and the, and the conditions of immunodeficiency, the most notable of which is is HIV. So basically, if you take a person with an HIV, they will meet, and, and you blind the doctors who are performing the diagnosis or the treatment. A person, if they don't know that the person has an HIV, but they just perform a number of tests, that person will easily meet the criteria for at least one autoimmune condition. Basically, they're producing. It looks like they're producing, you know, autoantibodies, and you know, their body is trying to to reject their tissues. But they're systemic, so there's really no organ. So I guess you can reframe if if you believe the official diagnosis, you can reframe HIV is a uh, systemic autoimmune condition. There will be a, a perfectly valid definition according to the current diagnostic criteria. Is it like the steroids, are they acting on the immune system primarily through destroying the thymus gland? Oh, absolutely. And, and the reason I mentioned the increased ratio uh, of incidence in women versus men is, so let's start with something obvious. So estrogen is something that does a number of things in the body that can push you into the direction of both autoimmunity and immunodeficiency. Now, here's here's something that immediately tells you something's wrong with the official theory. The autoimmune condition is supposed to be a condition with with an immune system in overdrive, right? So it mm-hmm. should be the exact opposite of a person with a condition of immunodeficiency. However, the two tend to co-occur um, almost always. So a person, like I, I just give an example, the person with HIV, they can easily meet the, the official diagnostic criteria for a number of autoimmune conditions. So you can't have it both ways. One of these one of these theories is is wrong, or both are, are are explained by you know by by a higher umbrella, if so to speak, and and that high umbrella in this case can be can be tied to the hormones estrogen and cortisol. So estrogen does a number of of detrimental things, and it's to keep in mind when I say estrogen, it's not just the estrogen you're producing. There there are tons of chemicals in your environment that have estrogenic effects, and they're much more potent than than estradiol, which is supposedly the most the most potent estrogen your body produces. And ionizing radiation is another is another agent that has extremely highly estrogenic activity in effects on the body. The polyunsaturated fats are a great example because they're both estrogenic and immunosuppressant. So what estrogen does is basically it activates the adrenal system. You, your adrenal glands start producing more cortisol. At the same time, estrogen is turning off the negative feedback response. So so basically your your pituitary gland doesn't really get the signal that you're producing too much cortisol. So you'll keep increasing the production of the hormone called ACTH, adrenocorticotropin hormone. So you'll keep producing even more cortisol. So that's what estrogen does. It, it, it's, it is the stress hormone. It is the shock, the shock hormone. So as long as estrogen is high, you will have high cortisol. And estrogen and cortisol, they promote each other. Both estrogen and cortisol increase serotonin. Both estrogen and cortisol increase prolactin. So you will get Basically, the, the, the entire plethora, the, the, the whole field of stress slash disease. Um, and everybody knows, nobody, nobody denies that cortisol destroys your thymus. So at the same time, because these are the, the truly catabolic hormones, there will be tissue breakdown. So it has been shown that in people with autoimmune conditions, if you can inhibit, basically, if you can remove portions of that tissue that is considered to be, uh, to be damaged, Basically, the the immune the immune response uh, stops. So, the much more likely view, in my opinion, the much more the one that is that's much more likely to be associated with reality is the fact that the immune system response is simply there to clear the debris that are caused by decaying and dying cells. And and this this decays, as we all know, it's usually triggered by the stress response and and by the by the uh, resulting bioenergetic deficiency. And if it's if it's systemic enough. You, you, you will essentially get either HIV or cancer. If it's localized, you'll get the, uh, you know, one of these official autoimmune conditions that are known by names like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, if it's in your joints, multiple sclerosis or lupus, if it's in your nervous system, uh, psoriasis, if it's, if, it's, if it's at your skin. So just because something appears in a specific organ, that does not mean it is not a systemic disease. In the vast majority of cases, it is. And it cannot be any other way. These cells communicate with each other. They cells they send signals that are that are distributed around the entire body. So your entire body knows, for example, that you you have a lesion on your arm, and and that lesion is the the psoriatic lesion. So you're likely to have symptoms of psoriasis elsewhere in your body, no matter how much motor medicine tries to deny it. For example, people with autoimmune conditions, if we assume they're all being caused by by estrogen 
by ionizing radiation, basically by chem by toxic chemicals with, with estrogenic activity, you will expect people with with a, with a high estrogenic burden to have a high incidence of liver disease. And lo and behold, that is the case. Go pick any autoimmune condition you would like, and then go and check on PubMed and see if these people have a high incidence of liver disease. They all do. So to me, that is the smoking gun that the one of the hormones, specifically estrogen, is directly causative of the pathology that results in the immune response. And the immune response is simply there to pick up the debris and get rid of it because if, if it accumulates too much, you will die from probably from septicemia or some other kind of a um, blood poisoning. So, and you bring up a good point. Like these steroids are often not thought to be involved in so-called autoimmune problems. Like you'll see somebody focusing really tightly on what their physician, like the, the antibodies, but they don't measure things like the prolactin level or they're ignoring a high TSH or they haven't checked the temperature of the person. And it, it seems to be uh, like a compartmentalized view of what's going on. Like they already know that the body is destroying itself. So uh, they don't really investigate the other markers. Right. And I think the, uh, the main reason is because uh, the official medicine says there is no, there is no known cause of these things. So the best thing we can do is manage the symptoms. But here no. is why even managing the symptoms, it is idiotic the way it is currently done. So there, basically the mainstream therapy in the absence of all of these commercial drugs for, for 50 years, it has been cortisol, right? So almost anybody with an autoimmune condition, if they have a, the so-called acute exacerbation, in other words, a, a flare up or an attack, so to speak, what they'll do, they'll get, they'll get a shot of cortisone, right? So in some people, at least back in the day, like 30 years ago, this was actually the, this was, this, this was their chronic treatment. They were getting cortisone injections or infusions for years, sometimes for decades. Now, if the immune sauce system was the problem and you were suppressing it with cortisone, which it does very effectively, you would expect that this would be the so-called disease modifying treatment, right? Well, not only it wasn't, but these people died a lot earlier than the ones who didn't get any treatment. So right there and there, and I think the pharma industry wisened up to that fact. That's why they started going after all these other drugs. But they all, their, their underlying mechanism of action is all the same. They suppress the immune system. And if you look at any ad for any immune condition, I do challenge you. Go on TV and look at any ad and listen to the side effects. They all have increased chance of blood cancers, lymphoma, and a particularly nasty thing has, ha has been happening recently and it, it, it's known to be caused truly by the JC virus. It is a condition called uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy (PML). Just Google PML and and you know and, and read the Wikipedia page. It is a very nasty neurodegenerative disease that kills you in about a year. So you can think of it as a very accelerated version of of the disease ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Except that this thing truly truly destroys your brain very quickly, and, and you die from the same symptoms as as you do from ALS. So Anything that any drug for an autoimmune condition that suppresses your immune system, and pretty much all of them do, will have that listed as a side effect. So if you listen to the ads on TV, they'll tell you um, there's an incre increased risk of a number of blood cancers, including lymphoma, and and I think uh, amyoblastic. Uh, I, I have to see, but one of the one of the leukemias, increased risk of multiple myeloma, and increased risk of other cancers. They're finding lately of especially of neuroglioblastoma which is the brain cancer. Uh, brain is especially, especially sensitive to the, to the suppression of the immune system and, and, and anything with, a, with an estrogenic effect. So, so basically, anything that suppresses your immune, immune system, whether that's cortisol or one of these newer drugs, the side effects is cancer. So, so that's, that's what current medicine is offering you. And I think the, the, ex, the official explanation is that, well, yes, so what we did is we calculated how many people are likely to get cancer as a result of this drug. And of those people, how many are likely to die? And we compared it to the number of people that are likely to die from not treating their condition. And we, you know, we basically decided on pure cost-benefit uh, analysis as a result of that, that it's worth, basically, that it's worth pushing these drugs. Remember, first of all, we don't know if these numbers are right. And the reason we don't know these numbers are right is aside from the fact that Big Pharma is known to lie and falsify evidence, which Daniel Sanjo referenced on that. There's actually even it made the New York Times that um, the you FDA. You don't need to send me a reference. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was uh, apparently it's it is so systemic. It is so systemic that that right now there is a serious doubt that about 700 of the 1,000 most important generic drugs being produced and sold in the United States, 
the 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 evidence around them is at best questionable, and in some cases, the it, it was known to be fraudulent. But uh, basically, so so that's basically what what you have there uh, as you know as a as, as the official treatment. So um, I, I challenge you to go to go and check for yourself. Uh, basically, you know, if you get any of these drugs. Uh, so I wanted to also point out that. So the reason we we shouldn't be trust so easily trust not so much because the FDA may be evil or incompetent, but because we don't truly really know. And Ray said it many times, and it's been verified. Most older doctors will tell you we don't know the full side effect profile of a drug uh, until at least 20 years have passed after with that drug being in used in the wide circulation. So that is the only. In other words, that is the true clinical trial. It's starting to sell that drug to the general public. And, and 20 years later, accumulating the data and seeing what that drug does. So, in effect, all these clinical trials that are being that are being done for all of the drugs that you're currently putting in your mouth, all they really achieve is showing that these drugs will not kill you immediately. In other words, within a year. Anything anything after that is fair game. So, something I love that Ray said was that X-rays used to be used to treat acne and uh, ringworm and, and lupus. And then my friend Lex Rooker, I think he's about uh, 60 years old. He verified that and told me, yeah, I used to go get x-rays for my acne. And the bizarre part about that being that he expl explained how effective it was for temporarily reducing the inflammation and getting rid of his acne. And of course, the long-term harmful effects of getting chronic x-rays for a problem like that causing uh, things like cancer and so on, and never really knowing if the treatment you're receiving is safe until way later, like you're talking about. Yeah, and and you know, I I think whenever whenever you're about to ingest a drug which even now has the admitted side effects of increased cancer, you should probably be asking yourself is 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 this really worth it? Now, I'm not encouraging people to stop taking their drugs. What I am encouraging is that you should question your doctor to the very end and ask. And, and ask for data and ask for basically for information and evidence that it is truly worth it to take a drug for a condition that in many cases is not lethal. I know it's very unpleasant, but you should question your doctor to, to give you his or her view of why the, the bene, basically the benefit is higher than the risk in this particular case. And, you know, you shouldn't just accept the regurgitations from, you know, because many doctors will just hand you over the brochure, the brochure that the pharma company gave them, and they'll say, read up on that. Would you read as, you know, as would you take as the official version? Like if you, if you go to your mechanic and he says, this car is done, it needs to be replaced. Wouldn't you ask for a second opinion, you know, <laughs> somebody who is not involved? And actually, ideally, if you take it to another mechanic, that mechanic may also say the same thing. You know, keep in mind they're in the same industry. So they all have an incentive to fix your car and charge you. So it would have been great if there was a way to go to somebody who is not, who does not have a vested interest in you buying that drug and, and asking for a second opinion. Unfortunately, for many people in the Western world, that's not possible because any, any doctor will have a vested interest because they're probably selling the same drug. That's how they make money. That's how they pay their loans from medical school is by selling you these things that, that official uh, pharma brochures say that they're safe, both safe and effective. So like shifting over to the alternative, because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are convinced that their physician might not know exactly what they're doing. What's wrong with something like, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the paleo autoimmune protocol, it's a highly restrictive, basically vegetable and meat diet. Uh, what would be wrong if you had, if you were diagnosed with a uh, autoimmune problem, what would be wrong just tackling that diet to the extreme? Do you, would you see any problem with that? I see a huge problem with that. I mean, basically that diet is, is the, uh, 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 it's basically the reduced version of the official treatment with cortisone. Uh, what you will get from eating all this meat and vegetables is likely a drop in blood sugar because protein stimulates insulin release like nothing else, not even glucose compares to it. And, and and after that, after after blood glucose falls, you will get a cortisol increase, right? And and cortisol uh, will basically start eating at your muscle tissue and destroying your thymus, and and essentially and also uh, stimulating the release, the, the production and the release of estrogen. So it will burden your liver. It will inhibit the conversion of of the active of, of the hormone T4 into the active hormone T3. So basically, if we if if we uh, agree with the idea that 
cortisol and estrogen, these catabolic stress hormones are, are only beneficial in the short run because they, they suppress your immune system, but they truly contribute to pathology long term. They'll be one of the worst diets you would want to do. I mean, it'll be it'll be not as powerful, but it will be similar in principle to doing the radiation treatment, right? Um, or eating a, a diet that's high in PUFA that probably will have a similar effect, or getting a cortisone uh, shot. I mean, if, if anything, <laughs> that the cortisone shot may actually be the least damaging because <laughs> because there are ways to control the side effects of cortisone. I don't know if there are side effects, if there are ways to control systemic side effects of a bad diet, right? I mean, I, I can't just, the, there are things, uh, if, it, if you increase your intake of the hormone DHEA, um, maybe even progesterone, you can negate some of the side effects of, of a cortisone injection that is given to you for acute exacerbation. But if you eat a poor diet that chronically, that basically tells your body that these things need to be overproduced, I don't know, you know, basically how would you defend on with uh, against that other than correcting your diet, you know, they'll be, they'll be the first thing to do. The, the other side of that coin usually is attempting to quote, fix the gut end quote. And usually the way to do that from the alternative is to take fermented foods or prebiotics or probiotics. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so here's a, I think a perfect example is if you think that probiotics are good for you, I should tell you that even modern medicine admits that the lactobacillus strain, it may be a direct cause of lupus, right? So if you don't believe me, if you don't believe Ray, just go to Google lactobacillus space lupus in Google and, and read the links that are coming from PubMed. That's official research. You know, don't read the blogs. I mean, even some of them are legit, but you know, if you want to show your doctor something that, that he or she will take more seriously, if they're, <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe they won't, but you know, the <laughs> yeah, show, show up with PubMed studies if you want to have a 1% chance of being taken seriously. <laughs> So do that and basically see uh, there's a serious there's a right now there's a serious debate about whether whether the some of the lactobacillus strains especially I think the case one lactobacillus case is a direct cause of 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 the trigger that actually starts lupus they're not going to say it's the it's the causative agent in, you know and basically you should be eating yogurt and things like that they're saying it may be the thing that triggers that bad immune response that never seems to go away for example I don't know that that there has been a single case of a baby, which tends to has a mostly sterile gut, of a baby having um, an autoimmune condition. Um, and also, I've seen studies on animals, on, ad on adult animals, that have had their guts rendered sterile. In other words, be, there, there's almost no bacteria there. These animals are remarkably resilient to things like uh, endotoxemic shock and the development of, of autoimmune um, uh, conditions. There is, a, there is a rodent model of multiple sclerosis. It's called uh, EAE. I think it's uh, encephalitis, autoimmune, uh, allergic autoimmune encephalitis. And it's the, it's the, I think it's the rat model of multiple sclerosis. It has been shown that the taking the human equivalent dose of tetracycline, I think it was only about 100 milligrams given to the rats, basically prevented them from, from developing this condition no matter what causative agents the scientists try to administer. And so, when, so, when we're talking about autoimmunity, we're really talking about tissue damage. Is exactly. That, is that so, right? So okay. I think this should be reframed. The, the term autoimmune should be reframed into there is excessive tissue damage going on somewhere. It's always it's always systemic, but you may have the, the exact symptoms in a specific in a specific tissue. Even though if you test if you do the proper test, you will probably find the systemic biomarkers as well. So I think the autoimmune condition should be reframed as systemic. Uh, tissue damage, systemic wasting syndrome almost, if it's systemic, like HIV basically is the autoimmune condition of the entire body. Um, you, you know, and, and that's if you, HIV people basically waste away, kind of like diabetic people or people with cancer. In fact, if you if you see a person with advanced AIDS, it will be impossible for you to tell the difference between that and a, and a cachexic cancer patient dying from basically the loss of, of, of muscle mass and, uh, and, other, and other important tissues like the thymus and your liver and, and your brain. And you mentioned there was a drug for AIDS that the the sole mechanism of the drug was to deplete phosphate, showing the importance of regulating parathyroid hormone and prolactin, which they seem to increase and antagonize each other. Yeah, and here are some of the other things that have been tried for cancer. Uh, I'm sorry, for for AIDS, not antagonize uh, each other, increase each other, rather. increase each other. Yeah, so 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 depleting phosphates was one thing, which has the side effect of increasing calcium. So the calcium to phosphate ratio will increase as a result of that drug. Other things that have been tried for AIDS include aspirin, 
As a matter of fact, the trial was so successful that it was stopped in the mid-90s. And if you look at the preliminary results that were published, they said it is extremely promising, but some people got elevated liver enzymes, so we stopped it. Nobody mm-hmm. died, right? I mean, these people have a deadly condition. Is that a reason to stop a trial? But apparently it is. But the, the, the conclusions are there. Three grams of aspirin, uh, no, I'm sorry, four grams of aspirin daily for two weeks basically completely remove the symptoms of AIDS. And we're not talking about HIV. We're talking about AIDS, which is already the manifested disease. These people already are at risk of dying from pneumonia or even from a simple flu um, uh, virus because their immune system is, is, is already destroyed. So inhibiting the release of free fatty acids, which is one of the primary mechanisms of, of aspirin, and opposing estrogen, which is probably the primary uh, mechanism of action of aspirin, even though it binds to no known receptor, right? The, the, if you look at the way aspirin stimulates the cells and the way it works on metabolism and the way it works on tissues, in, in basically, and if you count, let's say you pick like 50 different ways it does that and you do the same thing for estrogen, it will be approximately in the opposite way. So you can think of, as, of aspirin as the functional estrogen antagonist. So that's a, aspirin was very successful. Niacinamide was also extremely successful. Three grams of niacinamide for a month, it, again, Put these people in, in remission, right? So what does niacinamide do? A number of good things, but again, primary thing is lowers lipolysis, so inhibits lipolysis. You have you have less free fatty acids in the blood and increases the levels, increases the ratio of NAD to NADH because it, niacinamide is a precursor to NAD. So it improves, it puts your, your body in an oxidized state versus a reduced state. If you check the NADH levels of any person with an autoimmune condition or HIV or cancer, you'll find that it's abnormally high. Normally, the ratio of NAD to NADH in healthy people is about 1,000. In, in sick people, it can drop to as low as 100 or even lower. So all of these people, that will be a very good way to test for systemic disease. Check the NAD to the NADH ratio. So an, an isinamide being a precursor to NAD raises that ratio. And basically, um, when, you, when you raise that ratio, your body uh, can, uh, it does not have to be stuck in glycolysis. So whenever you have an overproduction of NADH, and we discussed this in one of the previous shows, whenever you have an excess of NADH, the body needs its, its NAD in order to continue metabolizing it to keep you alive. So what does it do? It, it, it tries to oxidize NADH back to NAD. And in the absence of oxygen, in hypoxic conditions, in anaerobic conditions, when oxygen cannot do its job of oxidizing NADH back to NAD, normally does it in the electron transport chain, the body will use pyruvate to oxidize, basically to oxidize NADH. And in oxidizing NADH, pyruvate will be converted to lactate. So test anybody with an autoimmune condition or HIV, you will find that their lactate is high and carbon dioxide is low. So if you look systemically, there is very little difference between a person with an HIV and a person with cancer. There's very little difference between a person with an autoimmune condition and a person with cancer. It's probably just a matter of of intensity, right? But, however, if you look at advanced cases, and I think there was a recent study done on multiple sclerosis, people with advanced cases of multiple sclerosis, it's called primary progressive MS, PPMS, they had actually the same systemic biomarkers as um, as people with stage 3 cancer. So, this tells you something. These are diseases that are apparently caused by different agents, right? Uh, a lot of them apparently are genetic, so at least that's the official version. However, they all seem to manifest in, if, in a very similar, if not the same way. And the agents that help are all agents that oppose estrogen, oppose cortisol, stimulate oxidative phosphorylation, inhibit excessive glycolysis, stimulate the Krebs cycle. So it all comes down to structure and function. Without proper energy, in other words, without proper function, you cannot maintain structure and some cells will begin to disintegrate. What is the natural response of the immune system in this case? Go out there, take these things and get them out of the body, right? You don't want to die from a blood poisoning. That's the purpose of the immune system, not to attack you. And in a very similar way, that's how cancer develops. In a hypoxic condition, the cells, since they cannot perform their differentiated function, they revert back to their primary function, which is division and growth. Han Selye's work forms a good foundation for that, what you just mentioned, the general adaptation syndrome, and how something like stress and energy could result in all these different diseases. I think he mentioned, like, if if you uh, were talking to a caveman and were telling him electricity could light a lamp and a radio and a computer, the caveman would be like, you're crazy, but uh, (laughs) we kind of do the same thing with medicine, like, oh, it has to be all these very specific things and they can't relate to each other. 
then, then why are they together in the same sack, right? <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, random, randomly the environment by, by random mutation and <laughs> random decisions of, of uh, impersonal atomic forces. Somehow these things came together. <laughs> Okay, so besides eating a diet that's metabolically stimulating, you, obviously getting enough calcium would be important. And you mentioned some really basic cheap therapies like niacinamide, aspirin, methylene uh, blue, methylene the, the, blue. The, the tetracycline antibiotics, uh, biotin. Oh, I, here we go. I think the perfect example for this show. Recently, and and apparently the results are so promising because that's what they want to call them. You know, you know. Basically, um, there was there were three concurrent trials, and they're all advanced phase. In other words, it has already been proven more or less that this thing works. High dose biotin, which I explain how it works um, in a minute. High dose biotin, by high dose I mean 300 milligrams, was shown to stop advanced multiple sclerosis in its tracks. Now, here is the that's the good news, of course. The bad news is that high-dose biotin, believe it or not, it's considered a pharmaceutical drug. You cannot buy high-dose biotin. If you, wanna, if you want to administer this dose to yourself, you're basically left with, uh, I think by law, a uh, pill cannot contain more than 10 milligrams. So you have to be ingesting 30 of those a day. That's, you know, that's oh. very inconvenient. And the rumors, actually, that one of the companies that, that develops, that did this trial, that paid for this trial, has applied to the FDA for permission to actually to actually outlaw even 10 milligrams per pill. So what they're what, what they're trying to do is they find out they find out that biotin works, and now they're trying to make it impossible for you to get a dose of biotin that may work for this condition. Now, why why would biotin work, right? You know, it's just a simple vitamin. Now, I cinema, by the way, it's another vitamin that was shown to reverse virtually every autoimmune condition that was tried. You don't believe me? Go to Google, type niacinamide rheumatoid arthritis, <laughs> niacinamide multiple sclerosis, niacinamide psoriasis, uh, niacinamide lupus. Try all these things. I mean, niacinamide is not just pro-energetic. It actually restrains the excessive immune response because it, because it improves the health of the tissue. There's no reason to go and, and clear the debris. So it's it has multiple path, uh, pathways, multiple mechanisms of action that I think of uh, modern medicine is, is, is even – right now is just beginning to understand. Let, let's go back to biotin. What biotin does, uh, essentially, and one of its primary functions is it improves the function of the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. So if you're stuck in excessive glycolysis, right, all this pyruvate doesn't get shuttled to the Krebs cycle and gets converted to lactate. And the reason you're stuck in glycolysis is because two enzymes that are basically responsible for taking the pyruvate and, and giving it to the Krebs cycle, the two most important ones are pyruvate dehydrogenase and pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase is a thiamine-dependent enzyme, vitamin B1, and, and also manganese and magnesium. So thiamine and manganese or thiamine and magnesium, that's what you need for pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate carboxylase is, is basically is an enzyme that can take pyruvate and convert it to acyl-CoA, just like pyruvate dehydrogenase. That's a biotin-dependent enzyme. So any of these two is not working for some reason, and PUFA is a great inhibitor of both, as is, as is ionizing radiation, as is estrogen, as is pretty much any cortisol increasing therapy. Cortisol is a great deactivator of pyruvate dehydrogenase. You want to give yourself the cancer metabolism temporarily? Try high dose cortisone. See what that does to you. And, and measure it. You can measure it. And and some people, you're talking about specific experiments and advanced stages of disease, but say you were relatively healthy, like egg yolks would be a good source of biotin, liver is a good source of biotin. You yes. don't necessarily have to supplement all the things you're you're talking about. Yeah, I don't think you have to get uh, take them in the high doses that were used for clinical trial. These people have have primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Basically, these people officially have about five years between diagnosis and needing a wheelchair, right? Yeah. And or or basically needing needing uh, help with artificial breathing even sometimes because they get a paralysis of their of the basically the trachea and the muscles that are responsible for breathing. So so these these were people that are in desperate condition, and in those people, three hundred milligrams of biotin within six months reversed all of it. All of it, right? And then, I, 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 this is to me is a positive sign that there's a turnaround. That I think people are starting to realize how how wrong current medicine is. The official, at the, at the conclusion of the study, the official explanation was biotin dramatically improves the energetic status of the organism. So there you have it. Biotin is one of the vitamins that Ray writes about too. Now here's another important thing: why you don't want to eat the egg whites. Not only are egg whites because now they're very popular. Everybody eats egg whites because it's cholesterol, right? So we already talked about cholesterol, but I'll mention it for another reason. Cholesterol is vital for the functioning of your immune system. If you have low cholesterol, you can get symptoms of autoimmunity just by having low cholesterol. 
With low cholesterol, you can die from the flu. That's one of the primary purposes of cholesterol is to deactivate viruses that are that are invading your body. So, and many people with autoimmune conditions are, are actually on cholesterol drugs because, you know, oh, it's bad cholesterol, it's going to give a cardiovascular disease. Anyways, so the reason you don't want to eat egg whites, uh, two main reasons. First, you're getting an abnormally high amount of tryptophan, and that's a, that's the amino acid that will convert into serotonin in your body, and especially so in sick people. It has been shown that pac- uh, patients with cancer, HIV, autoimmune conditions, in, in these people, the enzyme tryptophan, tryptophan hydroxylase, both type 1 and 2, is dramatically overexpressed. So almost all the tryptophan they ingest, you'll get converted to serotonin, not to niacin, right? Not, not to the vitamin B3, which is what you wanted to do. So if you eat only the egg whites, you will get an abnormally high rate compared to other protein of tryptophan. And also, the, the egg whites contain an enzyme that binds biotin. You can induce biotin deficiency very easily in people by feeding them egg whites for five days. So it is the egg yolks. And actually, you should be eating the whole egg. There is a reason why this egg exists in the shape that it does. <laughs> You know, all these these attempts to create a better food are they're not they're, I should I would should have gone this misguided. It's always good to test and experiment. But when there is no no mechanism why something why something modified is better for you, you should probably err on the side of caution and eat the whole organic thing. So if you eat too much egg whites, you will deplete yourself of biotin and you'll give yourself extra serotonin. So eat the yog and preferably the whole egg. It's got cholesterol. It's got it's got a lot of other good stuff for you. Actually, even it even has some androgens in it. Do you want to touch on sugar's role in supporting immune function? Because that's a, a common argument launched at consuming sugar that it will suppress your immune system. And you're talking about increasing cholesterol synthesis, and the fructose component is exactly uh, very good for increasing the liver synthesis of cholesterol. So, so that's a very good point, actually. I just mentioned that cholesterol is very important for the function of your immune system. So without eating sugar and specifically fructose, which is a very efficient precursor of cholesterol, um, you either have to ingest cholesterol from your from your diet, basically pre, pre-made, like in, for example, the eggs are a great source of cholesterol. So, so are most meats or products that contain some kind of a saturated fat. It usually, they usually go together because saturated fat binds cholesterol. Um, and, and in the body, the basically the chylomicrons that carry cholesterol around, um, and the VLDL cholesterol, basically, that's the it's vital for them to have a, a, a good supply of saturated fat, not poofer. So basically, without sufficient supply of of sugar, you will probably not produce sufficient cholesterol. And if you're not ingesting it from your diet otherwise, mainly due to restricting cholesterol-rich foods, like everybody seems to be doing lately, basically your immune system will be um, will be malfunctioning. There was a study published, I think it was back in 2010, which showed that people who lowered their cholesterol somehow, and it didn't matter if it was through statins or avoidance of dietary cholesterol or, or, or doing something or maybe over-exercising, which is another thing that, that may reduce your LDL and raise your HDL. Maybe it's another thing we can talk about why you don't want a high levels of HDL. So if you do anything to lower your LDL cholesterol, that is the true good cholesterol. Stop listening to this nonsense about HDL. Things that raise HDL are invariably toxic. So ethanol raises HDL. Ionizing radiation raises HDL. Um, excessive yeah. exercise raises HDL. Do, do these sound like things that in excess are good for you? Yeah, es- no. estrogen does too, right? E- exactly. Estrogen does too. Um, basically, the women on birth control pills have been heralded as having a perfect you know, cardiovascular profile because their HDL is, is, over, is over 60 you know, and uh, you know, you want it to be you know, anything over forty is perfect. No, it's not true. It, it is is a response to to some kind of a toxic, noxic agent that is inside you, and that's what the body uses to to deal with it. So you want the LDL cholesterol, and you know, basically, you want you want to ingest it preferably from food. If you don't, and if you limit your sugar intake, your total cholesterol will be low. And people with low cholesterol, regardless of the cause, have been found. To basically, levels of low cholesterol were found to predate cancer diagnosis by more than two decades. Now, think about anything else that can be so predictive about, about your chance of getting cancer. Low cholesterol is predictive of your chance of getting cancer. Actually, it increases it by 11 times. And it's predictive of, ge- of developing cancer two decades before there is actually a sign of cancer in the body that can be diagnosed. Before we wrap up, do you, just because I know we'll get questions on it, do you want to address high levels of cholesterol and how that could be related to low thyroid function? Yeah, basically, the, 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 one of the, well, there are many, just we talked about the immune system, but one of the basic 
uh, functions of cholesterol is to be the precursor of all of your steroid hormones. Now, if, if the levels of cholesterol are high, this could mean basically uh, two things. You, you're either eating too much of it or you're producing too much of it and you're not converting it the way it should be into pregnenolone, which is the first step. And then for pregnenolone, you can either convert it to DHEA by, by the enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid hydrogenase or to progesterone by the enzyme 17 alpha hydroxysteroid hydrogenase. So if you have high cholesterol, this is strongly suggestive of, of a steroidal deficiency further down the chain, with the exception of cortisol and estrogen, which, which tend to accumulate. So you will have, if you have high cholesterol, chances are you have high estrogen and high cortisol and low levels of the protective steroids that, that happen to be in between. And why would you have a low, basically a low conversion of cholesterol into these steroids? Well, several reasons, but two of the, of the, of the ones that have been proven consistently are low levels of thyroid hormone, or vitamin A deficiency. Now, vitamin A deficiency will inhibit the function of the two enzymes, 3-beta-HSD and 17-alpha-HSD. And without thyroid hormone, your, your cells, because the first step of creating the pregnenolone from cholesterol happens in the mitochondria, your cells will not be able to perform that step. It is dependent on NAD, and thyroid hormone. NAD, basically, if you're reduced state, you will not have enough NAD. So you will not be able to convert enough cholesterol. So high cholesterol more than anything else, is, is diagnostic of, of poor metabolism, of potentially hypothyroidism, or deficiency of vitamin A. And in some cases, basically, some people have deficiency in one of the enzymes, like 3 beta hydroxyl or 17-alpha, that, that is caused by external agent. You go get an X-ray, even a simple X-ray will inhibit the function of these two enzymes, and also will inhibit the, the side cleavage enzyme in the mitochondria. So you'll be stuck at the cholesterol step. You won't even produce pregnenolone. Almost any toxic agent has dramatic effect on the on the steroid enzymes that are basically between pregnenolone and, and further down. But but the, most toxic agents do not inhibit aromatase and they do not inhibit 11 beta hydroxysteroid hydrogenase type 1. These two enzymes are responsible for, for creating uh, correspondingly estrogen and cortisol. You go and get a radiation or any kind of a toxic agent to, to, to have an effect on you, you will upregulate dramatically the function of the two enzymes at the very end of the chain and you will inhibit the function of the enzymes further up on the chain. So you will give yourself the stress response as directly measurable by these two hormones. So in summary, if you suspect or have been diagnosed with autoimmunity, the basic idea of being to restore energy metabolism throughout the entire organism to protect the tissues because the autoimmunity, so-called, is the result of damaged tissues. Yes, that will be my, my main approach is to confirm or at least try to rule out because, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, uh, completely excluding the possibility that you may have a viral infection or some other kind of a process going on that is causing the immune system to to sort of, quote unquote, attack that, that specific tissue. But that is very rare. And in the absence of evidence for that, the first thing I would do is try to try to test for overall metabolic function. Um, you can measure, one of the best ways is to look at the levels of carbon dioxide. You can do the thyroid tests. You can, some labs will be willing, actually most labs can do it, some doctors will not be willing to prescribe it. You can test for the NAD to the NADH ratio. Is that um, a blood can, test? Yeah, it is a blood test, yeah. It's a very simple blood test. It's actually one of the cheapest. Um, I mean, I asked my doctor. He just gave me the weird looks of like, why do you need that? And I said, well, why is it like we can't do it? He's like, no, it's just nobody's ever asked for it. He's like, I did that in medical school when you know we were studying the cellular response to toxins. And I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, basically we, we showed that radiation dramatically lowers the NAD to the NADH ratio. And I didn't go any 24. I mean, to me, that, that immediately right there was the evidence. Basically, radiation slow it metabolically kills you in a sense. It just puts you into. So yes, I would try to do tests that confirm um, that they try to give you an idea of where your metabolic function stands. If you have high cholesterol, chances are metabolism is not working well. If you have low NAD to NADH ratio, again, if you have low, I, I think the high cholesterol combination of high cholesterol and and um, I'm sorry, the high cholesterol and low carbon dioxide. These two combined are probably the cheapest and the most, and give you the biggest bang for the buck in telling you where, where you stand metabolically. Um, it is not a coincidence that with age, cholesterol increases, carbon dioxide decreases. These are all these are all basically biomarkers of how well your metabolism works. Nobody's denying that. Nobody's denying that with age, cholesterol tends to increase. Nobody's denying that with age, uh, carbon dioxide tends to decrease. But nobody wants to, to try to explain why, at least officially. I mean, there is evidence 
if you're willing to uh, search for it. In in its official sources, it's not it's not Bob's journal. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's the journal of uh, 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 journal of American Medical Association, which is the bastion probably of um, of sociopathic medicine. There's also the New England Journal of Medicine. All of these are established journals, and they do publish these articles. They're just they're not as many as the opposite, you know, the opposite view, which is a genetics, you know. Somehow, by getting older, all these bad genes are starting to prop up and, you know, and you're starting to express them. Why exactly everybody, it seems that it happens to everybody around the same age, yeah, it's genes, you know. What are those genes? I don't know. We'll find out. $200 billion later of the Human Genome Project, utter and complete failure. New York <laughs> Times calls it failure. Washington Post calls it failure. Uh, there, there are calls already to defund it full, completely. Not nothing, nothing useful has been produced out of this project that has improved people's lives. The only thing that came out of it is mountains of paper and research that materialized into nothing, truly into nothing. I, I don't know of any other, um, to be honest, any other human endeavor that has been so publicized and has produced so little with so much funding. And on that note, we'll have to save that for another show. Georgie, thank you so much for talking with me today. Where can we find more of your work on the internet this week? Um, if you want to to read some of my posts, including the uh, uh, posts on the topics that we discussed today, the best place is probably the Raypeed Forum. Um, the website is www.raypeedforum.com. Oh, it's all one word. Um, and um, I'm a I'm user member, hey dude, on that forum. It's spelled H-A-I-D-U-T. Um, and you can also send me an email. Um, my email is, again, the username H-A-I-D-U-T at gmail.com. And I um, also have a company that uh, produces some supplements. The website is www.idealabsdc.com. It's all one word. Um, and again, I would like to emphasize I am not a supplement. I'm not in the supplement selling business to make money. If you, all, if you want to take my ideas that are there and make the supplement yourselves, Please do so. My biggest goal is to, to show you that there's stuff out there that is cheap and it works. It's it not is based and it's the so, the theory behind it is more solid than all the all the poison that you see advertised there. And if you if you want to check for yourself, pick any ingredient that is in my supplements or something that Ray, Ray has come up with with or he has written about. And I challenge you to find to go and find the side effects of that thing. Usually it's cough and nausea. So compare that to the leukemia you're getting from the uh, from the latest drug for rheumatoid arthritis. Georgie, thank you so much, man. Thanks a lot. That's going to conclude this week's episode of Generative Energy. I'd like to thank Georgie again for talking with me today, along with my patrons for their support of the show and all the content I produce. If you enjoy the show, please hit that thumbs up button on YouTube. That really helps us out. And also leave a comment with your thoughts and constructive criticisms or any questions you had about the content of the show. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about next week, but it will probably be genetic determinism, which is a huge topic, so that's why we actually moved it to next week. So hopefully you enjoyed the show. As always, thank you for listening. Your, the support of the show is overwhelming, and it makes, me, it makes it really fun to continue to do it because so many people are enjoying it. So thanks again for listening, and I'll talk to you guys soon.